Hey, what's up everyone? My name is Walt Ribeiro and I am one of Linode's developer advocates. Let's just jump right into it. Tim Allen is known for a ton of things, one of them being his work at the Django Foundation and at the University of Penn, and he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to Postgres. No, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. So what I want to do today is show you a little bit about how we can create a database, back it up. It's always important to back up databases. There's a the whole science behind how and when to back up databases, um, as well as restore it. That way, if there's ever a problem or a hacker gets into your system or whatever the problem might be, um, you can have backups of your important data and restore it when you need it. So let's show you how to do a couple things. How about that? Sure. So I've just brought up my VS Code instance, and I've got the terminal maximized on it right now. So what you're looking at right here, this is Ubuntu 20 on my local machine, just in a virtual machine. So it's Ubuntu Linux running 20, and I've got, uh, I've got Postgres installed on it. So there are two main commands we're gonna wanna use with Postgres. When we do a backup, there's a command called pgdump. And you'll see here, it's got all kinds of options and I'll walk through them uh, in a few moments. So you'll see pgdump dumps a database as a text file or to other formats. So it gives you a quick uh, description of what it does. So when you want to back up a database, pgdump is the most straightforward way of doing it. Another command called pgrestore, which as you might expect, does the opposite. It takes that file that you've created with pgdump and restores it back to the database, typically overwriting it. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna create a service user um, which only has access and owns this database, which is a best practice. It's good to create a different user uh, to own each database with different credentials. Then we're going to make the database, create a table within the database, insert some data into it so that we have something to back up. And then we'll back that up. I'll make some changes to the database and we'll restore it. So you can see that those changes we make after the backup, when we restore, they're gone. Okay. So That's a, that Postgres, sounds awesome. Yeah. So this is just sort of a Postgres convention, but when you install Postgres on most systems, it creates a special user called Postgres, which um, has administrator access to all the database functions. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna switch over to the Postgres user. So I'm now, as you can see over here, mm -hmm. I am Postgres. <laughs> and what that allows me to do is when I type PSQL to come to the Postgres command line, this little hashtag here, much like on Unix, indicates that I am the super user in Postgres right now. So what this allows me to do is I can create user, Linode user, with password, Linode password. Whoops, and I made a mistake. We all do. So user is an object, not a string. So only the password needs to be quoted here. Okay, so it's created me my user and it echoes back that it successfully created the role. So what I'm gonna do now is create a database called Linode DB with owner Linode user. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating an entire database and saying, let the person who owns it, who has, let the user who owns it who has access to do everything to this database be the Linode user I just created. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And now that I am done creating the database, I can quit out and stop being the Postgres user. So just back to my normal user, which you can see uh, brings me back to this prompt. So what I'm now gonna do is pass PSQL. So if I do PSQL dash dash L, I'll actually do that over here in this window. You'll see it gives me a lot of options here. And I often like to split my terminal like this so I can have the help with all the options on one side, typing on the other side, just because there's so many of them. And it takes a while to get to memorize them. But the main ones I'm interested here is in how to connect. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect with this username, Linode, User. And we are going to connect to the Linode DB. And we're going to pass in a password. 
which will be Linode password. Hmm. There we go. So what I had to do, I had to explicitly pass the host being localhost. Okay. So now I am on as the Linode user we just created on the Linode DB. And you'll see it's not giving me this hash because I am no longer the super user. So I only have access to the database that we just created. So what I can do now is create a table within the database. And we'll create an ID column as an integer. And we'll create a name column, which is a var card. And we'll just make it 200 characters long, keep it simple. So we've now created a table. And if we want to take a look at that table, we can use slash DT for describe table. And you can use tab completion in here, which is kind of nice. And you'll see. There's the table. And if I want to know more about it, I can do the dash D plus describe more Linux table. And you'll see here that it gives me what I've just created, the ID that's an integer and the name that is character varying. So what I'm now going to do is insert some data into it. Insert into Linux table one comma Walt. I'm typoing all over the place today. That's okay. Yeah, you know what, when I see th that things aren't working, that's actually the best part because then I'm able to kind of like walk through of like any kind of like errors that you're fixing. It's kind of fun too. Uh, some of the computer scientists I look up most to, I've seen them live code and it's just so nice to know that everybody makes the same mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I forget to import libraries of Python. I forget you know, the values word, which I've been using for 30 years of my life, <laughs> it just happened. So now we've got two rows in the database. So if I do a select all from Linode table, you'll see we now have Walt and Tim. Okay. So we've got the two rows, so fantastic. Now let's say we wanna back this up just in case something horrific happens. So I'm gonna quit. And what I'm going to do is back over here, if I do PG dump dash dash help, there are a bunch of different options I'm going to use here. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is the capital F allows me to specify the format. And I typically use C for custom, which rather than plain text uses a binary Postgres format that's just a lot more reliable. Um, I'm also going to pass the dash C, which does a clean backup, which means it will drop any database objects before recreating. So when it goes through the commands to recreate the database, it makes sure to include the drop. Um, I'm also going to include dash X. So it doesn't include all the privileges. So it's not going to um, try to recreate all the users and who has access to what. Then we're going to use the same options I just used to connect, specifying the host, the user, the database. And, uh, and we'll see if I can actually get this all right. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so you don't, you don't memorize this, right? Like you usually leave it as a separate terminal space to the right, just so you can access it, right? Yeah, so it's interesting. People who do this more often than me probably memorize all these commands, but I don't back up and restore, you know, five times a day. It's something I do, you know, once or twice a week. Okay. So it's just not quite frequent enough to have everything memorized. So there's no shame in, you know, doing the help command or going to Stack Overflow um, for looking at what flags you're going to need. Okay. Um, and I'll show you later on what I've done to fully automate this in my Django space. So if I come to PG Dump. And I said, we're going to do the custom format like that. We're going to do clean. Um, we're not going to do any of the permissions. Then I have to put dash H localhost, dash U, 
the node user. Now, does 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 the order matter? Like, if you do dash capital F before or after the dash H, is no, there a certain you it, you sequence? Can it, you can do it any order you want, but for dash H, that's the host. So you have to make sure that the local host comes right after the dash H. And dash okay. U is user. So you have to make sure that the username comes right after the dash U. Um, okay. But other than that, the order doesn't matter. So what I'm going to do is specify a file name here. So you'll see it actually writes it as a file. I'm going to call it a Linode Backup SQL C. And I'm going to call it SQL C because we're using the custom format here. So that's just a convention that's good to follow. OK. And then we called it Linode DB. And now it's going to ask me for the password again, Linode password. And can you explain what does custom do? So what exactly? custom does if if here I'll show you I'll show you both in a second. So um, so if I actually take a look at this lin so I've made this Leonard backup file, and if we take a look, you'll see it didn't take long because there's not much data in it. But if I actually tried to take a look at this, you'll see it's in a binary format where you can see some of the text within it. It's telling you the database name, the version of Postgres it's under, that it was made under Ubuntu 20, and what kind of client-side encoding it has, UTF-8. But you'll see there's a whole bunch of uh, stuff that you won't understand in here. Now, if I do the same command again, the PG dump, but I don't give it a custom format, And now let's take a look at it again. See how this is all just plain text that you can read? Okay. So by doing yeah. different formats, you'll see that it just gives you all the commands. But this is not as robust a format as the uh, as the custom format. It doesn't contain um, all of the information you might need to do a proper restore. So I tend to always use the custom format. So that's okay. what dash FC does. And to just show you that that can be put anywhere, I'll put the dash FC here. We'll run it again. And if we look at the Linux backup, you'll see we're back to our weird format here. So we've done this. Let's go back in by PSQL, and you'll see if we do that from our Linode table, we still have Walton 10. But let's pretend I am now a hacker. So I'm going to come here, and I'm going to insert a bunch of garbage. Your mom sleeps with the fishes. <laughs> So we'll have some fun with this. So now if I look at this, oh no, I realize my database has been hacked and there are two horrible rows in it. So what can I do about that? You know, if they've if it's if it's a hacker that's done something really malicious, it's not just going to be two rows in the database. You know, perhaps something has gone wrong, perhaps they've changed things. And we want to roll back to that backup we've just made a couple minutes ago before this happened. So if I now quit out of this. We can take a look at the PG restore command. So if we do PG restore, I'm going to pass some options here. And again, we can come to uh, the PG restore command over here. And you'll see we're passing clean again, which will drop objects before recreating. So it creates everything fresh. And the dash dash, if exists, uses the if exists when pre when dropping objects. This prevents errors. So what the if exists does, it says if we're restoring this to a brand new database that doesn't have anything, we can we will only drop the objects if they exist. Because if we try to drop the objects without that if exists, it will say that it can't find an object to drop. The if exists suppresses that error. So it's just it's a little something I'd like to add just for my own sanity. So let's restore it back to localhost. We're going to restore it to the same spot we just did with the Linode user. 
And um, we have to specify what database we want, which was Linode DB. Um, can you also explain what clean means? That first dash C. Sure. So the dash clean means that it's going to drop any existing objects. And what that means is rather than it's going to drop that entire Linode table we've created that has the garbage in it, and it's going to start it from scratch from the okay. If we didn't do that, sometimes with different flags, it could just append to that table. So at the backup, we took two rows. Um, the drop is just a much cleaner way of making sure that it restores to exactly what you had when you took the back. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and type Linode password. <laughs> and now if we come back to our PSQL here, And we do our select star. Ta-da! Congratulations. We have taken down our horrible hacker who said that my mom sleeps with a fish. <laughs> um, so that's a quick and dirty example of how we can create a user, create a database that is owned by that user, insert some data into a table. So we, we logged out as the Postgres root user once we created the database. We logged in as that user we had just created that only has access to this database. We then created a table as that user and we inserted some data. Then we took a backup. We inserted more garbage data as the hacker and then we restored it from that file we created, which is right here, the Linode backup.sqlc. So that's a full life cycle right there of what you might want to go through with a database. And of course, you know, we've done a very basic example here, but the same exact process I walked you through would work with a huge database with billions of rows and hundreds of tables. So take it back to like, before I set this up, let's say I know nothing about Postgres or I'm just learning. And so Linode has a one-click install of Postgres. When that's installed as the database, how are you accessing this? What's it look like before, like before this? So I do host uh, a bunch of uh, Postgres databases on Linode, and there are two ways of doing it. Um, sometimes you have to connect to, so if you're hosting it on Linode's hosted service, I believe you have to connect to a host other than localhost using the dash H. If you're running your own Postgres within your own Linode VM, then you can connect to localhost. And that's the way I typically do it. So what I normally do is I'll SSH to my Postgres machine and then issue the PSQL commands on that machine. Okay. So, um, that's just the way I do it. Neither way is better or worse. The one-click install is easier. I just like having a little more control over my own Postgres machine. Sometimes I use weird extensions. But you know, for 99% of you, I would probably encourage you to start with the Postgres one-click install. Another beautiful thing is with what I've shown you here is if you decide that you want to eventually run your own Postgres machine because there's like some kind of text search extension you want to install that maybe Linode doesn't have on its core service, um, you can use the PG dump from Linode's core version and then restore it to your local version switch over your database credentials in your app, and you'll be all set to go. So you can start on sort of the centralized one-click version, and then if you need to grow beyond it, you can, using these very commands we just showed you. So a lot of this, if you're running a Django app, so I'm mainly a Django developer. Um, I absolutely love Django. I'm a member of the Django Software Foundation. I've helped organize DjangoCon over the years. Um, Django has an ORM and a settings um, function that you put most of your credentials into Django's settings. Um, so rather than reinventing the wheel and trying to um, you know, remember all these command line options, I built a package you can actually install um, called Django PG Copy, which automates all the things we've just looked at hmm. and serves as a cheat sheet for me. So I'm gonna share my screen over here for a second. Okay. If you take a look here, this is Django PG Copy, the package that I help run. And there are full instructions on how to install it. So you can pip install it in Python with Django PG copy. And it takes a number of parameters, but pretty much works out of the box. So 
with, with some sane defaults. So if I come to the home page here, you'll see another handy part of this is if you look through the code, you'll see how I've been cheating here. If I scroll down, you'll see that this is exactly where I was getting my command line options from. So what this really does is just, it takes Django's settings and fills in the blanks so you don't have to remember your ridiculously long passwords or anything along those lines. And uh, takes the command line options and for the most common options and puts them in here. So the handy part of that is, for example, if I come back over here, I'll show you if I come in to um, if I come into Django shell and I can pass the settings for my dev environment. So you'll see here it fires up my dev environment. If I import the settings in my dev environment, and I go ahead and print settings.databases.default boost. Oops. You'll see this is the internal host name for a development server. We don't keep it on a public network, which is why it ends with private. So that's from an internal network. So that was for my dev server. You can see here config settings dev. If I look at my user space though, let me actually show two things. So there's the host, and there's the database name. You'll see it's got T Allen for Tim for Tim Allen Words Web. So that's the database name, and this is the host. So if I quit out of that, <laughs> I'm getting my Postgres versus my Python quits. Now if I come back to my dev settings and we do the same thing. You'll see it's the same host. It's our dev. It's our dev database server. But if I go ahead and print the name, you'll see that it's no longer T Allen Words Web. It's just Words Web. So this gives me the host and the database name. And last but not least, if I come to our production settings. And do the same thing one more time for the host. You'll see instead of PG Web main dev up here, it's PG Web main. So since Django has all of these in their settings, what I can do is use these settings to fill in the blanks rather than type them every time. So the upshot of this is if I do manage pi, the command I wrote is called PG backup and pass it my production settings. What I can do is start a backup here. And this is going to take a little while. So you'll see it's chugging away. It's a very, very, very big database. But you'll see it gives us feedback. Backing up database words web on host, our production server, to this file. So what that's telling me, it automatically timestamps it. So you'll see it's making a backup with a timestamp. Now, why is that useful? I'm going to go ahead here and terminate that. If I do now manage.py pg restore settings equals config settings user, you'll see this shows me all of the backups I've taken automatically and lets me choose which one I want to restore. So what this does in two commands, it allows me to back up my production database and copy it over to my local database so that whenever I need new information from production to run tests or I want a refresh locally, I can do it within two commands without having to worry about all the command line options, which just works a lot more easily for me. So this is a product that I've open sourced that anybody for any Django app can use. 
Um, another handy thing about it is since it automatically has your password stored, it's, for example, you could set up, you know, a backup every hour of your database. You could set up a backup every day of your database. You can write logic around that um, to make sure that you have different cadences in your database so you can restore it if anything horrible ever happens. And then you can um, also use it for copying your files between development and production. One way we use this um, in a real world use case is we have a staging environment and Django creates migrations that we wanna make sure work. So what we'll do is anytime we have migrations is we actually back up our production database and restore it to a temporary staging database. And then we test the publish. So it'll run those migrations on the latest version from production in a staging environment without actually affecting our production environment. And if that works, then we can be comp confident that we can do the same thing against the production database. And that way it will never impact our end users. So that's a bit of an advanced topic, but with these fairly straightforward tools, um, you can start to build things out that uh, really give you control over your data. And uh, Postgres makes this all available to us. And can you walk me through any other extensions that you would use with Postgres? Because you said, there was one sentence that you said like that you use, quote unquote, a ton of extensions. Could you maybe <laughs> just give me like a few that uh, kind of stick out to you? Yeah, so Postgres, and I'll, I'll stop my screen sharing, but uh, Postgres comes with a bunch of extensions baked in and even more that are developed by third parties. So two of the more interesting ones I'm using right now. In a personal project, I have a single table with about a billion and a half rows in it of attributes about companies across the world. So everything from like, you know, international business machines is the company. IBM is the ticker. It was founded in this year. They also have other identifiers called things like QCIPs and firm nodes and things of that nature. You know, what, what was it, what state was it incorporated in? We have tons of this information about every company in the world and including the company name, International Business Machines. I used an extension to Postgres that comes package called the Trigram Similarity Extension and built what's called a Trigram Similarity Index. And what that does, that's what allows Google to do things like, did you mean? So if you type in something wrong and the spelling's off, Trigram Similarity, what it does, it looks at every three character chunk of a word and sees how many of them match up. So if you spell a word perfectly, it would be like a 1.0 match. If you get one letter wrong, it would be like a 0.95 match. So the score goes down. But this way you can find out um, things that were possibly typed wrong. So the example I've been using, uh, so Ford Motor Company is a well-known company here in the United States, you know, maker of the Mustang. Um, I decided to make it Norwegian and changed it to the Fjord Motor Company, F-J-O-R-D as a test. And uh, using the Trigram Similarity Index, it instantly brings back all the results for Ford Motor Company property. Hmm. Um, so that's a very handy way of doing it. Another thing I'm using is what's called, um, there, there are a bunch of different index types available in Postgres, but there's a third party one that's developed by a, a couple of absolute mad scientist geniuses out of Russia called RUM indexes, which allow very fast text search um, not quite on par with as good as Elasticsearch, but very, very good. And um, if you don't want to get into the business of getting into hosting an Elasticsearch instance, Postgres text search will often be very much good enough for anything that I'm doing on the web. And um, especially with speed given through things like RUM indexes, it's been fantastic. So there, there, there are tons of these different kinds of extensions. There's some... If you're interested, for example, in stock market data, um, a company just across the river in New Jersey uh, called Timescale DB does an extension um, that's specifically for time series data. So if you're looking at stock market data or anything that has, you know, that goes sequentially through time, it's specifically optimized for searching and finding um, things that are time series. Um, and no other database I know has this much flexibility to it. So that's why we've sort of landed on Postgres after my journey through all the other options. <laughs> and for the last part, can you walk me through deleting your database too? 
Oh, absolutely. Like, let's just like wipe it clean. So, it all away. <laughs> yeah. So, so we've set up the two ro rows of Walton Tim. We've hacked into him. We've backed it up. We've yeah. rolled back. Now let's just wipe it clean and start and start uh, start from scratch again. Drop database. Leonard DB. Can't drop the currently open database. So what I have to do, I have to swap over to another database, and then I can drop it. And now it's gone. Okay. Be, be very, very careful with that command because as you can see, uh, it does not ask me if I'm sure. It does not ask me if I'm certain I want to do this. <laughs> it does not ask me to confirm. It just blows it away. But fortunately, I still have that backup so I can restore it. <laughs> you know, it sounds like that there might be room for an extension that asks you if you're sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> there's been uh, there's been more than once I've hit enter and then had an oh no moment in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a few li lines of code. You know, you could probably make the extension in a couple of days. Yeah, the most know. typical mistake I've done. So if I restore this really quickly. Um, oh, the DB doesn't exist. So I've actually got to recreate the DVD. If I've got to recreate the database. Uh, oh, okay. It, it'll be a bit of a runaround, but the, the mistake I typically make is, is this going to actually let me do it? I don't know if it will. I wonder if you have to create. So I'd have to create it as that Postgres super user. Again. Yeah. The mistake I typically make um, sometimes is I'll write an update query and forget the where clause, which will then change every row in that table. <laughs> whatever value I send. <laughs> In addition to that, Postgres supports so many different extensions and community pieces um, for doing things like rich text search. So you could really build out, you know, you know when you go to Google and you put in a typo and it says, hey, did you mean this? Postgres has functionality for all those sorts of things too, and advanced text analytics. So for a lot of the big things coming up in, uh, in machine learning and AI, it's really a found... I found it to be an ideal choice for a lot of those workloads as well. So you can start very basic with it and uh, it will grow with you much like the Python language as well. Mm -hmm. One other advantage of Postgres is it's a relational database that you can have a document model in. So they have a great column type called JSONB where you can put JSON into a single column within a relational database and you can even build indexes into it. So it's, they're really cool features. <laughs> that is cool. Okay. Well, hey, I guess that that just about wraps it up. Thanks again. Thanks so much for having me. It's been wonderful.